an interview between Erica Lieberman and myself, Deborah Henson Conant. We will be interviewing each other about the 2024 Somerset Harp Festival. We are both teaching at this festival, which is the largest folk harp teaching festival in the United States. And we'll both be teaching there in July. And we met last year and had a really fun time talking to each other. And um, we both are performers as well as teachers. And we both love dressing up in fun ways. Although Erica dresses up in Renaissance costumes and I dress up in leather if I can. <laughs> and, and we'll both be teaching. So um, if you're seeing this live, you may be able to chat with us. And so if you have specific questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or say hello. And if we see them, we'll be able to pull them up on screen and answer your questions. So Erica, hi, what will hi, hi. <laughs> um, it was so fun to meet you. It was so fun to meet you. I think we met at um, a, while we were having lunch and we just started talking about, you know, what we're doing and performing and and how much yeah. fun it would be to talk again. So it's really fun to do that on air. Yes. So, yes. So what are what are you about? What's your thing? Let's start there. Well, um, so I'm primarily a Renaissance Fair harpist. That's where I started my career and I'm still going 25 years later. Um, I started uh, performing at the New York Renaissance Fair in my late 20s and, um, and various other fairs around the East Coast. And then um, I actually took a, a hiatus when I had my son. Um, but then uh, about four or five years ago, I got back into it and I'm doing it again. And now I play at Renaissance fairs all over the East Coast. Yeah. So you, you like, do you get fun. in a, you, you put your harp in the back of your car and you go to a Renaissance fair? And I like, do. How, how many costumes do you have? Oh, at least a dozen at this point. Yeah, I have, I have a costume closet, a separate closet of Renaissance Fair. Wow. Uh, costumes just, and, yeah. and what kind of music do you play and are you improvising or are you memorizing it? So I, um, I memorize all my music. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, at first, when I first started doing this, I learned the hard way about how difficult having sheet music at an outdoor event can be and the problems that can arise with the wind. <laughs> um, so, um, and I'm not, I'm not a very good sight reader anyway. I never have been. So by memorizing, memorizing comes easy to me. So oh, I wow. yeah, it's just, it's always been that way. I have a much better, much easier time memorizing music than, than reading it. That's so, great. Um, yeah, so it, it it's a really handy skill to have as a Ren Fair harpist because you can I can't do either of those things, so I'm impressed. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't believe that. <laughs> no, no, it's true. I'm I'm not a good reader and I and I can't memorize anything. I, I can learn I can learn the structure of something and how it goes, and then I can reinvent it or, or regenerate it, but I couldn't possibly play like the same notes. I couldn't remember what they were. Wow. Well, if you didn't just reveal that, I don't think anybody in the world would know it. <laughs> nobody watching you would know. <laughs> and, and I'm sure nobody cares anyway. <laughs> no, nobody cares. Yeah, as long as, you, as long as you're comfortable with what you're doing. So I, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions about this because it's because you're so you're playing outside. What do you do when it rains? Well, that's a really good question. So, um, when it when it's really raining if i'm not if i don't have a covered stage i can't play i see um, sometimes uh you make friends with the merchants or I you see. know and and they'll let you play in their you know in their store oh. um it really depends on on what kind of relationships you build um but if i can't play i can't play i'm not gonna you know my, my harps are expensive i'm not gonna jeopardize right. So now, now what happens if somebody comes up and they try to lean on your harp while you're playing? Does anybody do that? <laughs> um, excuse me, my lord. Please I step see. Me away. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Because when I yeah. used to, years ago when I used to play like you know, cocktail parties and stuff, people would just come. I've actually had people like put their drink on the top of the harp, and I was like, but 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 but, but, but. 
no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Nobody All right. touches no, no, no. Okay, that's great. All right, so let's talk about what we will be teaching at Somerset. So why don't we go back and forth? And okay. You, and 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 why don't you? So we so on at Somerset. There's there's three days. There well, there's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and Thursday is sort of the the opening, and I'll be doing a like a kickoff. A workshop on Thursday, which is called an add-on. So it's a longer workshop and people are paying extra for that. And that is, don't ask me, I'm going to look at my sheet. We always make, <laughs> I get so excited about these workshops and I make them and then I'm like, what did I do? And then, so it is called, it's called create a performance that connects. So Ooh. people are always asking me, and I haven't done this yet at Somerset or anywhere actually is actually talk about performance, taking a piece of music that you're comfortable with. And what do you do to actually connect with an audience with that? Wow. Right. So that has some, that has to do with making sure that you're not trying to play something that's too difficult, especially in your first piece. It has right. to do with how you connect with the audience, often telling a story. So what I find is very, um, um, whenever anybody plays music for somebody, especially if somebody says, oh, you have to play the harp, or play me something. If you sit down and play, usually you're nervous. Mm -hmm. And often it's a situation, especially people are so used to like American Idol and contests that they're looking for, are you good or are you not good? And mm -hmm. so one of the first things you wanna do is to shift that completely. And you can do it a couple of ways. So one of the things, and I'll be showing this in my workshops, like one of the first things I learned to do was to always start with something that looks fancy, but it is easy and gives lets me be comfortable. So for example, if I'm gonna play some tune in C, I'll play a G, which is the dominant, and I'll do this. I'll just gliss until I'm perfectly comfortable. And then... You know, what, whatever I'm playing. But it, <laughs> yeah, so, so the first thing is to ground, to actually allow myself to ground. But even better than that is to start out by saying... You know, I started playing the harp as, as an adult. And I saw a harp in a store window and I thought, wow, it would be so magical to do that. And, but I thought that's something I could never do. So to, uh, to tell the story, the Genesis story of how you started playing the harp and do it with music. So I love to teach how to sort of break it down so you can tell a story. And it looks like I'm talking while I'm playing, but I'm not. I'm playing and then I'm talking. And then I'm playing and then I'm talking. But because the harp is so resonant, you can, you can, you can talk. I mean, you can look to the audience and talk. And this shifts the situation to where they are no longer looking, is this person good or not good? They're now in your story. So it's one of the greatest things that you can do to connect with an audience and actually get them to, to be in your world of what you're doing. So these are part yeah. of it. Yeah, that's, that's one of the- an amazing tool, Deborah. And that's that's something that I, I always love about your workshops. And I remember last year, I took one of your workshops about telling your story with the harp. Mm. And you you talked a little bit about what, what you just mentioned. And I, you know, and but the thing that I love about, you know, you give us these, these tools to keep in our toolbox and right. just things that we can pull out and they really they make such a difference like that that you know telling your story i've used it since your your workshop and i've used it um especially they they really loved it um when i pulled it out of my toolbox at uh, at adult living facilities I've been oh. using it there and they love it. And I can connect with these people in a way that I never could before. So rewarding, both for me as, as the performer and for them, you know? So it well, really- Now you're making me think also, wow, and you can tell their story too. I mean, you could <laughs> like, you could ask them to tell a story and you could play for them as well. 
good. But so, good. so blah, blah, blah. Yes. I mean, like, I, I, I the thing <laughs> that I love, one thing I love about the harp is how accessible it is to storytelling and to connection, mm -hmm. in part because it's so resonant, so that you can play. Hello, I'm, it sounds like I'm still playing, but I'm not. So I have all this time when I can do other stuff. Yeah. And it, it really oh, gives me access to that. So um, I love that you that you use that, that you that you already used it. That's beautiful. So anyway, um, the um, create a performance that connects. Let me see what else will it be. I don't truly remember anything to do with the notes. Ha ha. Okay, it doesn't even say here what I'm going to do. So anyway, that's that is that's one part of it. The another part that allows people to connect, of course, is to be able to make eye contact, to be able to smile to be able to walk onto the stage with a sense of confidence mm. and to actually, and it's funny, but there's some, these little things, I worked a lot with um, uh, physical comedians, physical performers, because my teacher was a physical performer and they would ask me to do things and I'd be like, that's stupid, that has nothing to do with playing. But then <laughs> years later, I realized how valuable it is. Like they were saying, come on the stage and just, outline the harp, really make that connection. And I was like, but it's not music. And then when I saw someone do it, I realized, oh, I am actually, they're letting me, they're sh I'm showing them the shape of the instrument. I'm allowing them to touch it through me touching it. And I'm actually making that transition between here's a person and here's an instrument. And I'm actually making that transition. So these are all little things that don't require any additional notes, but they allow you to have a performance that connects where you get to connect with the instrument, you get to connect with the music and the audience gets to connect with you. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's the workshop that I'm gonna be giving on Thursday. That's called the add-on workshop. And that I think there's a limit to the number of people that can come to that, but I'm not sure. So that's Thursday. That's all right. Cool. Oh my gosh. I think I'm teaching a workshop on Thursday too. So, which oh, means yeah. I'm okay, what's your workshop? Yours. All right. Well, let's <laughs> well, let's find out what yours is. What are you teaching? I you know what? I I don't know which days I I know the workshops I'm teaching. I don't know which days I'm okay. teaching what. Okay. All right. You know? well, is, <laughs> well, I took it off the website. I I actually oh, typed did? it out of the website. Yeah. But that's okay. So, it doesn't matter. Okay. So, I'm not important. So let's Thursday. say, what am I teaching on Thursday? I don't know. Is it the Ren? Uh, all right. Well, I'm just I'm just going to tell you the ones that I'm teaching, and I don't know which okay. days. I'm teaching all right, one. good. Well, let's go back and forth. So you should okay. share one. So I'll, okay, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll tell you okay. about one. So, um, so one of them is um, is called. Uh, the Ren Fair Harpist, and it's um, it's how to get the job and what to do once you have it. So now a lot let me of just ask you something about that before you go any further. Aren't yes. you training your competition? Yes and no. You know, Deborah, I don't want to do all the Ren Fairs, okay. and I don't want to do this forever either. And okay. we need talent, and and, and you know that there's plenty of room. That you know, I there's. I, I do some fairs where there's another harpist oh, or maybe wow. even two. Sometimes you could take over. there could be 20 harpists at a round fair. <laughs> a harpapalooza. It's exactly. Harder. Yes. I, I've met some of my dearest harp friends because we shared a stage and, and we, you know, or we, we went back and forth and then we ended up saying, Hey, let's play together. This is you fun. Know, I just fell together. into that trap. So, I just, I just fell into that trap of thinking like there's only room for a certain number of harpists when in fact oh, there is room for so many and you're right oh, that as you train people to do this they're going to do a better job and if they mm -hmm. do a better job then people are going to be so happy to hire them that they will want to hire more harpists at more rent fairs exactly so that's great okay carry on <laughs> now feel free to say what you're going to teach so um so 
this uh, th this workshop is about just um, you know for people who are curious, for people who have been to a Ren Fair, maybe saw a harpist there and said, hmm, "I wonder if I could do that." You know, so this is sort of a, a lecture um, type of workshop. It it talks about what it's like, what you know, because it's not for everyone. It's it's a lot of work. You don't make a lot of money at it unless there are some people who do it full time and they mm. have they travel all across mm. the country all year mm. round, which is a very mm. specific kind of lifestyle. So if that's not, you know, what what you're into, um, then, you know, it, it, it might not be the kind of thing you want to get involved in. But um, or, you know, if you you're looking to do it part time as sort of a, a side gig kind of thing, it, it might be exciting, it might be a fun challenge. Well, it sounds um, like it could be a great class, even if you just wanted to do a fair in your neighborhood, yeah. just to, to be able to bring something like, or even if you, it sounds like if you wanted to dress up and go into a park, that it would be helpful to kind of know a little bit about how you might do, you know, what kind of repertoire you might use, how you, yes. I'm assuming you're going to talk about costuming and moving your all harp of, and all of that. All of that. And the, I think the most exciting part of this particular workshop is, um, you know, it's it's really, you know, in terms of getting the job, it's it's not an easy thing to break into because entertainment directors of Renaissance fairs are looking for something very specific. So what I did was I interviewed the entertainment directors of mm. a bunch of different Renaissance festivals around the country. And I asked them what they look for when hiring wow. musicians. And they gave me some wonderful, wonderful information that I will be sharing in this workshop. So um, secrets. So it's yes. So secrets of the wow. trade and how, how to get noticed um, if you want to get involved in, in Ren Faire performing. So. Now, let me ask you some questions that, um, that Maureen, who's the head of the festival, asked us to take a look at. Like, how is, um, when, blah, 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 what, how would people prepare for this class? Mm -hmm. what, what might they do so that the class will be even more helpful for them in your particular class? Um, I would say, you know, I would say if you um, have the opportunity to go to a Renaissance fair, just mm. as a as a patron, just just to go, if you've never experienced one before, um, go to one, check it out, get the lay of the land, you know, especially your local one, um, and um, and kind of, you know, bring some questions. Look around. Oh, yeah, right. Bring questions and, to the uh, yeah. to the um, to your class. Yeah, that's right. great. Right. Look around, and and you know, at, the more you explore the Renaissance Fair, the the more questions you'll you'll have for me. <laughs> you know. Right. That's great, um. and that's right. So, and how is this going to work? Does this workshop work for people of all levels? Will it add something to their repertoire or to their technique or? Or is it just is it only specific to Renaissance fairs? This particular um, workshop really is is very specific. This is geared towards Renaissance fairs. Uh, that's that's what I'm going to be talking about. So that's it's great. Um, it's really for any, but it's anyone any level can can come or even people who are just interested. You know, I know that there's uh, you know non harping companions can come certainly if right. they're interested in the Ren fair world. Um, you know, it's just an interesting, informative uh, subject that isn't talked about a whole lot. So it might just be fun to to watch for for anyone. Yeah, that does sound fun. Um, I'm going to take a step back because I had forgotten about Kat, um, Maureen's questions. And I'm just going to take one step back to, to my workshop, The Creative Performance That Connects, and yeah. answer a couple of questions that she's asking us, which I think are great questions to ask at any point. Like, why did we decide to teach these? And I think right now, the two workshops that we've chosen, it's obvious why we chose these. That um, was my bad, Deborah. I should have asked you those questions oh, as the interviewer. Oh, yeah. How dare you didn't? <laughs> okay. So, okay. So should I ask them now? Yes. Oh, please okay. do. Yes. All right. So, um, 
let's see. So will will your workshop on Thursday work for people of all levels? Why, and yes, Erica. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of my thing is always about breaking things down to their most fundamental level. Mm -hmm. At least a lot of most of my teaching. Now, I also teach when I'm coaching high level harpists, like in playing my concertos, that's different. I'm going to be coaching them at a, at a I'm just going to be coaching them at the level that they're at. But right. when I am coaching people how to be how to access music and and use the harp as a platform for self-expression, which is the thing I love to do. Then I'm always showing people, like when I'm showing somebody how to tell a story with music, it doesn't matter, matter whether you can just play two notes or one note. Okay, this is one note twice. I mean, you, or, or just, or to do that. I mean, you can tell a story with a single finger. So yeah. it's all about how you're engaging with the content. And this to me, is, I've never said, I don't think I've said, I've said this before, but it's all about creative resourcefulness. So taking what you can do and what you have and being resourceful with it or creative with it, because you can be creative with anything, like anything. If you can play a single note, you can be creative with it and you can, can tell a story with it. So that's how it's possible for people because everybody at Somerset is an adult, pretty much. And pretty so much. everyone everyone has a huge life experience. They have stories. They have self-expression of their own. They may play another instrument. So one of the things I love to do is find out what where are you already self-expressed and then how can we use the harp as a platform for that or if you don't have that self-expression, how can we get you comfortable with and safe, feeling safe enough to express with the technical ability you have right now? So it's never about, I have to learn how to do this before I can do that. No, it's about take what you have and then how do we utilize it in this way to do this particular creative thing with. I love so that's that. How we're, thank you. Me too, because then I'm always, because then I'm always amazed. I always get to just see people be creative and resourceful. And so to me, it's just like candy, like, wow. Oh, you could do that. Oh, you could do that. Oh, you could do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I could say you could do that, but what happens is people come up with their own ideas. And especially yeah. when we're working in a group, you mm -hmm. can start, you can see other people's ideas and then you can take them and work and use them which is wonderful. And, and it's yeah. such a safe space to do that. You know, right. so right. often we, we, you know, what keeps us from self-expression is self-imposed blocks. Yes. That are, you know, we just don't feel safe taking that, that leap. Right. So to yeah. have a safe space to do that and to have that kind of support from your, your, your teacher and your colleagues is really amazing. So that's, that's, great. you know, Erica, as you say that I'm going back to, to the teachers that I got to work with. And I was able to work with a man named Tony Montanaro, who was a mime, but he was, a, he didn't wear white face. He, and he talked and he taught. So, so it's the, all the cliches of mimery were not did what he did. did he um, and just by going like this. Well, like yes, but, but I mean, air harp. Yeah, I mean, we did. He did. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was playing harp. I was feeling very constrained by the harp, and I went to him to find out how to expand my experience of the instrument. And um, so, what he more taught me how to do was 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 to tell stories with the harp. Was to to, to understand that every every gesture has more to it. I mean, you, you don't have to apply mime to the harp. Physical eloquence can happen in anything you do. Um, so why am I saying this? Um, why am I saying this? Oh, but he had a, one of the things I learned from him is, was something called rounds, where he would take, uh, we'd take an object, like we'd take glasses and we'd just go around the room and, and play with them. Everyone would play with them and you'd start seeing, um, it, the glasses would start becoming other things and you you just play with them or, you know, whatever you would do. And I actually took the harp in and everyone played with the harp. And as everyone played with the harp, I began to see other possibilities. 
So that that is another thing that I get to bring that kind of playfulness and that kind of creativity from, you know, from from when I was searching specifically for a teacher who could get me out of my heart box. Right. Wow. That's a great story. I hope you're going to tell it at your workshop. (laughs) I think I will. Well, you just made me realize that I can actually, because we'll be live, I can actually, we can actually do some of that experience, experiments or adventures that Tony taught. And I don't usually get to do it when I'm, when we're, when I'm teaching online. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now we've gone over two workshops so far. Oh boy. All right. Well, let's have another one of yours before we go on to one of mine. So what's another one of yours? So um, another one of mine is, um, oh, I am going to be teaching a Renaissance Fair tune workshop for both big and small harps. Um, Wait, by big and small, do you mean concert harp and lever and pedal lever harp, or do you mean large lever harps and small lever harps? Large lever harps and small lever harps. So um, lap harps, anything twenty-two strings and up, but but lever harps. I I have never seen anybody bring a pedal harp to a Renaissance fair. They wouldn't dare. They, they wouldn't, wouldn't dare. dare. <laughs> it's not practical. And, 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 uh, and I'm sure it doesn't fit with the era. <laughs> and it doesn't fit with the era. So, um, but I mean, really, if you think about it, neither do, do lever harps. I, you know, Renaissance harps are a whole different uh, ball of wax. But this is what's interesting about, um, this is a good segue to my workshop, because um, Ren Fair music is is not it's not the same thing as Renaissance music or early music. It's sort of a um, a fusion of of historical and modern influences. So, you know, you have your Playford and your, your, um, your Cantigas and, you know, your, your William Byrd. <laughs> this is all, uh, yeah, you know that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've heard of him. You, you, you got your early music, but you also have, um, you know, uh, uh, Wild Rover and, and Wild Mountain Time. And th- these are, these oh. are um, you know, 1800s, even early 1900s music oh. that, you know, are just as popular in the Ren Faire world as these actual historical pieces. Um You've got um, uh, music from Game of Thrones and, and um, you know, and even Irish rock bands, you know, like, like Gaelic Storm and the Prodigals. So you, you've got like this mishmash of um, historical and modern music that create this new Ren Faire genre. And it's all it's sort of stylized but it's um it's it, it's any ren fair you go to you're going to hear the same music so it's, wow. it's interesting how how it developed it's it kind of developed its own culture its own you know um its own genre really so you can actually develop a ren fair repertoire you could use yeah. it in other places as well so th- so i'm going to go to my rent what my interview questions mm-hmm. um why did you decide to teach this one? Well, <laughs> for one thing, it's my area of expertise and passion. <laughs> but also, you know, I could have taught it in, in a million different ways. And I decided to teach it this way because, um, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's for beginner and intermediate levels. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so we're going to learn some basic tunes, just, you know, very simple right hand tunes. And then we're going to explore different ways to um, treat the left hand and from from simple to more complex um, for and and these pieces can be played on both, you know, anything 22 strings and up. So for the larger, wow. heart, you know, we can do a little more stuff in the bass and but either way, people are going to be walking walking away with at least you know at least three or four 
pieces that they could play at a Renaissance fair. Wait, they're going to learn that in like an hour and a half? Yeah, these pieces are short. Now, now a lot of the, the, the way that I'm designing this workshop is, um, you know, there's a lot of Renaissance fair music that is very repetitive. So Great. it's a, it's a very simple tune played over and over and over again. So yes, we that's can great. I mean, I that. love that you're teaching that. And for, and yeah, and for anybody who's joining, joining us, I'm here talking to Erica Lieberman. We are both going to be, we have classes at the Somerset Harp Festival, and I am going to pull up a bigger um, little thing here. You can, for if you're a harpist, you can click this QR code and get directly to the Somerset Harp Festival, where you can register now for the festival, which is in July, um, so that you make sure that you get your tickets. And we're just talking about the workshops that we are going to be doing at that festival. So I'm going to close down this bigger one and then, but you've got also a little QR code up in the left hand. We're talking about each, right? <laughs> each of the uh, each of the classes that we're teaching. So, uh, so Erica, this you're teaching this um, Renaissance Fair music. People will learn three to four tunes, and mm -hmm. it's for beginner to intermediate, which mm -hmm. is really amazing because they're developing their repertoire. And one of the things I love about this is that one of the things I teach is ex how to expand your repertoire with improvisation. So if mm. people have a tune that they're comfortable with, then I can always come in and say, aha, in fact, I have a class that in which you would do just that. If you take Erica's <laughs> class and then you come to, I didn't even think about that, but if you do that and then you come to my class on, oh, it's on Saturday, I have a class called Powerful Harmonic Progressions. And in this, what I'm, so it, and right, and what it says here, knowing a few harmonic progressions uh, lets you improvise on a moment's notice, whether mm -hmm. it's to extend a tune, to bridge between tunes, or have a foundation to create a new song. And utilizing what you're teaching them would be a perfect opportunity because they will, that will be what grounds them. And mm -hmm. then they will be able to use these little progressions to expand and extend and come back to the pieces that you're doing. This is one of the great things about the festival. If you can kind of figure out, oh, I do this and then this comes over here and this adds onto this yeah. and this expands my ability. So that's, that's great. So <laughs> Beautiful, yeah, okay. So I like this. Um, okay, and how might people, um, how might people prepare? So I just realized people might prepare for my workshop on yeah. Saturday in um, Powerful Harmonic Progressions by taking your workshop <laughs> seriously in, in, in the Renaissance yeah. Fair tunes, because then you're, you're learning how, you're taking what you just right. learned, you're getting deeper with it and it, you're expanding it. That might be one of the I things love that, that. you're gonna do. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, I would say that the best way to prepare for my workshop is Tune your heart before you come to class. <laughs> that never occurs to me. <laughs> but that's a great, that's a great idea. Yeah, tune it so that we don't have to worry about it. We can just dive right in because um, that's let's get into the nitty gritty. But uh, everything else, I'm going to have prepared for you. So that's um, right. you know, you'll have. I, I, you know, I I usually print um, music for anyone who who. I didn't have a chance to print it themselves because mm -hmm. it's always, but if you can, you know, you, the, the, uh, the music will be up on the um, Somerset website. I, I don't, I don't know when she posts it, but I know it's well before the workshop. So before the festival, so you'll have an opportunity to print it or, um, or I'll, I'll bring some copies too. So I'll Great. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Tune in. <laughs> so for anybody who's joining us, I'm talking to Erica Lieberman, who is the Ren Fair harpist. And um, and we're talking about the workshops that we are going to be presenting at the Somerset Harp Festival, which is the largest teaching harp festival in the U.S. in July this summer. So we're going, going on. Let's say, um, well, I just mentioned one of mine, which was the Powerful Harmonic Progressions. Yeah. Um, and those, I'll just say again, that's on Saturday and it's so great. So rather than having to memorize music, 
knowing a progression and being able to actually play harp by numbers is very, very helpful. For example, if I say one, six, two, five, that means that I'm playing this progression. And it also means that there's a lot that you can do with that. You can add other patterns to it. Like this is that progression with a pattern. It also means that you can improvise over it. So you can play a very simple version of it and improvise. You know, it's happening in my left hand. And what's happening in my right hand is pa is just patterns. And notice again, I always want to point out to people that when it appears that my left hand and right hand are playing at the same time, they are often alternating. So I'm playing with my left hand and then my right hand, left hand. Huh. Then you only have to think about one thing at a time. Eventually, you get a little bit more comfortable and you put them together, but there's no advantage to putting them together. It works just as well because of this beautiful resonance of the harp. So having these progressions, this is one of them, having two or three of them means you literally can improvise at a moment's notice. Why would you wanna do that? I mean, there are certain times, no matter what you're doing, whether you're playing for a wedding, whether you are playing for um, music therapy, whether you are got a vaudeville show, who has vaudeville shows today? But if you do, <laughs> when, 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 yeah. um, when there's a moment when you're like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? Like either you get lost or something happens that you weren't expecting and you need to fill in something or you want to expand a tune. Like you learn a simple tune, it's very short, but you want to play it for a longer amount of time. These progressions allow you to do that. So it's like, it's a little bit like hamburger helper, which I've never used, but in, the, in that it takes one thing and it allows you to expand it. Yeah. So that, that's, what, that's what I love about the powerful harmonic progressions. It also teaches you something about harmony, but that's the really useful part of it. And the great thing is, of course, you can do it at any technical level. You can, that same progression, you can do with a single, with a single note, or you can do it literally. The same progression. It's, it's the same progression. It's just kind of, it's put on fancier clothes. And it's great to be able to realize that everybody in the room can play together. You're playing the same thing, but at the level that where you can really ground. So that right. really will be great for everybody. Let's see, we've got a question. That's amazing. Here. Well, you, you, you answered all the question of Maureen's question. So I, I don't have anything to ask you, oh, but I, I, will, I will point out that, that, that when you played between your right hand and your left hand, that reminded me of what you do with the storytelling. Right, right. A back and forth. That's right. Yeah. You know, it just, it never occurred to me to to try to improvise that way. And what why may why am I making it so difficult for myself? You know? Yeah. And, <laughs> I know. I mean, one of the thing one of the things that's it, 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 one of the things I learned when I was writing for when I write for symphony orchestra is that each instrument has its own like thing that it can do amazingly. And one of the things that the harp does is this um, incredible resonance and it allows you to sing into it like you play this and you could sing forever almost into that and then you can sing into that so there or somebody could play into it or whatever but the harp opens and it's actually more beautiful when you allow that space and that resonance yes um, we have a, a wonderful comment him here from Reham, who says, um, I thought you said tune your heart before you come to class. And I think yes. that's really great. I love that. I, I think you should do both. Tune your heart exactly. and your heart. <laughs> Thank you. That's really lovely. 
So for anyone who's joining us, I'm here with harpist Erica Lieberman, and we are interviewing each other about the courses that the workshops that we're going to be teaching at the Somerset Harp Festival in July 2024. And for anyone who plays the harp, just use this QR code and jump over there to take a look. Um, at the festival, you can sign up now, and um, and then it's what it's beaut. What what I love about the festival is it's live. You actually get to be with people. You get to be in the room with people. You get to go to concerts together. You get to eat together. It's just so fun, especially after you know the isolation of some of the past years. Mm -hmm. All right, so Erica, your next your next question. So Ooh. you've done. I've done two now, I think, and I've got one two um three how many do you have i've got three more i have three more okay how many, how many i only more have, have two more i'm only okay doing, that's I'm great four workshops okay. okay all right so i'll i'll throw another one in here so throw another one in yeah okay all right, all right. so <laughs> i'm really excited about this um there i'm i'm doing a class which is a play along class called calafipso now this is a piece that is a game. It's a game in which there are musical puzzle pieces. So there's the puzzle piece of the melody, which goes like this. And you clap. And you clap. And then two harps are in harmony. And you clap. It's a game that you play with the audience. It's also a game that you play with other harpists, a puzzle that you put the puzzle pieces together. So that's the melody puzzle piece. And then there's an improv puzzle piece that has the chords C, but it's, it's in a calypso rhythm. So it has the chords C, 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 G, and then G, 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 and then C, and then C. C, C, and then F, and then you go F, and then you go C, and then you go G, and then you go C. Exactly. <laughs> and so that's another one of the puzzle pieces is to play this rhythm and play this music together. There's two more puzzle pieces. The, th the, um, the third puzzle piece is the fun of getting to play. So now you're playing the chords, but you're playing it like this. C. And then there is the fourth puzzle piece. Well, there's four and four and a half. The fourth puzzle piece is just an open jam where you're jamming with the audience. It's like a rhythmic jam. And you get to do really fun things like or you, you get to make like, like rhythmic sounds like, which is really a bass drum. So you actually, I worked with um, with, um, a, with a composer from Venezuela to come up with some rhythms that you can do on the harp to make the harp sound like a batucada band. Oh and my gosh, so it's, so so it's cool. I, I am so excited about this class. It's just gonna be so much fun. And it's called Calafipso, a musical game for one to 100 players. <laughs> so, it's wonderful. Is, yeah, I'm really <laughs> excited about that class. Super, super, super excited about that. I, so I mean, I, now it's making me think that in future years, I think I might want to just do a whole bunch of musical games with people at Somerset because it's what's great about this game is that when you have a when you once you learn it you can play it with other people and then you can do it in concert you can do it with your audience right. and so you're playing the melody and they're clapping so and they clap you know so you have yeah. it and you have it all to play together and it's anyway so that is one of my classes Anyone can do it at any level because even if you can't do this, sorry, you can do it. You 
can do it with one hand or you can just go so there's so many so different ways level you're at you that's can there's right. something you can do some way that's you can right. participate and, oh, and the thing is that not only is that just like well you can play it at any level but when you actually have people playing it at different levels it creates this expansion that is similar to what you would do with an orchestra. If you yeah. would look at an orchestra score, you would see that everybody is not playing the same thing all the time. Some are playing a single note, some are playing a lot of notes. Yeah. And you can get that same effect by simply having people play at their level all together, the same rhythm. So I'm, that's, so cool. I can't wait to do that. <laughs> wow. Okay, so wait, now we have to answer the questions. When people are coming to your class, what's a great, oh, how can they prepare for this? All right, I wanna show, I wanna see, I wanna show them, there will be, let's see if I can find this. Okay, there will be music because I'm also doing this piece um, in the Netherlands with a hundred harps and in, in a Belgium harp festival between now and when I do it at Somerset. So I'm gonna share my oh, screen cool. for a minute. And I am going to show you what this piece looks like. Okay, so this is the game board of this piece. Uh -huh. You can actually see it, you know, the puzzle pieces, the melody and the jam section and learning to strum the harp and the percussion jam. So th we will be playing from this score. I mean, you'll have the notes written out as well uh, and I'll be teaching it. So I'm really excited about that. Wait, am I showing that to you? Are you seeing that? I'm seeing or, it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. great. Okay, so now I have to figure out how do I get back to the, okay, how stop sharing. Okay, okay, we're back. Oh, All so right. So for anyone joining us, I'm here in Erica Lieberman and uh, harpist Erica Lieberman and me, Deborah Henson Conant, are interviewing each other about the workshops that we are each doing at the Somerset Harp Festival this summer in July. I'm going to pull up. That's where you. That's where you can. Um, you can click that QR code to get to the registration page, and we're w walking each other through our workshops and asking each other's questions. So I'm going to take that down, and you'll still see the little tiny QR code up at the top. And we can also. Oh, I believe we have a question. No, that's me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Erica, let's see. Okay. So what's your next workshop that you're going to be doing? So my next workshop is called The Gigging Harpist, mm -hmm. A Walk on the Business Side. Ooh, nice. So some harpists are lucky enough to have a support team <laughs> or they've worked hard enough to have a support team. Let, let me put it differently. Um, you know, someone to do their booking, someone to do their marketing and publicity, someone who, who's in charge of their social media. There's so many elements that go into this business. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of us have to do it ourselves. That's just the reality. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, and it's a lot of work. It's, mm -hmm. it's a ton of work. So this is, um, this is a workshop that's really uh, a deep dive into the business aspects of what we do. And, um, particularly, um, you know, booking yourself, which wow. is really a, um, you know, something that a lot of harpists come to me and say, how do you get these gigs? How do you do it? And, um, you know, what, and I think there are other, I think that there have been other wor similar workshops at Somerset, and there may even be somebody else teaching a similar workshop uh, at Somerset this year. I'm, I, I can't remember, but, um, but I think, you know, what what makes my my workshop different, I think, and what makes, you know, what 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 I feel like I can bring to the table personally is um, I'm very much an out of the box thinker when it comes to booking. I don't enjoy playing weddings, mm -hmm. so I don't play them often. There is absolutely nothing wrong with playing weddings. Weddings are beautiful. There are a lot of harpists out there who play them much better than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very specific skill set mm -hmm. and it's just not my strength. Um, 
so, um, you know, people will ask, well, what do you do then? If you don't play weddings, you're a harpist, you're a gig harpist. Well, what do you do besides Ren fairs? You can't play Ren fairs all, all year round, right? Well, I don't. I also play Victorian circuses in the cemetery. I play in natural caverns upstate New York. I play at Dickens festivals. I play at libraries. I play at... Um, Oh, some of some other places I've played. Um, I played at, uh, at um, fairy events at botanical gardens. Um, I played at a, a haunted castle upstate during Halloween. I play at a Victorian high tea in Salem, Massachusetts every year. And these are these are repeating gigs. So I do a lot of, um, you know, a very specific market um, of, of fantasy and history. Um, and that's what I enjoy. That's where my passion is. And I've kind of created that that niche for myself. And I get a lot of work. I work all year round. So, um, so you know, this workshop, you know, how, how does that translate to a, another harvest? And the answer is that this workshop, you know, we're going to be talking about the practical stuff um, of, of the business, but I'm also going to focus a little bit on, um, you know, on, on what brings you joy as a harpist, mm. you know, mm -hmm. the, I think, I think the, the saddest stories I've ever heard are the ones where people who have, enjoyed playing the harp as a hobbyist so much and then they started doing it for a living and they ended up hating the harp mm. and i think that that is just so sad and awful and i don't want that to happen to anybody if you love the harp you should always love the harp that should be your gift to yourself mm. so um you know it, it's important to make sure that you continue to love what you're doing and to do that you know yes, you want to make money at it and you want to be successful at it, but you've also got to do it in a way that is going to bring you joy because that's going to translate to your audience and, and to who you're playing for. Well, I'm also hearing from the, I'm hearing this, I'm also hearing that you are bringing a special kind of joy and focus to the things that you're doing because it's kind of within the story that you're telling in life. Mm -hmm. it, it's the, you know, as, as you were talking about it, I was like, wow, it's like, she's bringing the magic. Like, it, I mean, and the harp can do that. It's like, she's bringing the magic to each of these magical experiences. It's almost as if you're bringing the, the scent of magic in the sound mm -hmm. of the harp that that experience oh that's very poetic i like that <laughs> yeah I, i'm excited too and i'm hearing that that here there's something about you know your persona that you're bringing your persona yeah and that that persona is lighting up each of these events that's and, that, that that's that's it that that nails it you know and, and i think that it, the answer to the question, you know, what can you do to prepare for this mm. workshop is think about what it is, you know, that, that, that you're about. What, what is it that, what is your story? What do you, what, what is your unique voice that comes out when you play the harp? And, you know, and, and what is the market that, that you're 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 telling that story to what is who who are the people that you most want to tell that story to mm. Mm -hmm. oh i love that now yeah. i know that we we talk about this a lot in hip harp academy and i and i know that sometimes many people including myself when i first started playing the harp I felt like, well, I have to be a harpist. Like it doesn't work. I mean, like if I just want to tell stories and play, that's too easy. And like, that's not a real thing. And I'm, I'm not really doing it. How will people actually know for themselves what it is that they love? Like I'm thinking if somebody loves books, if somebody loves to read, 
Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, so they might enjoy playing in libraries. They might enjoy actually bringing books alive. They might enjoy creating music for a, like a Jane Austen readathon or something. I don't know if there's such things, but the music that might be might be uh, have been around at that time. So if well, there's something, yeah, go on. For example, I I often work with a, a storyteller named Jonathan Kruk, and he is a um, he's an amazing performer. Um, he works all around the Hudson Valley, and we do um, we do uh, a Christmas Carol by mm. Charles Dickens together, and I'm mm. his accompanist. And um, sometimes we play at libraries, and he'll tell a story, you know, and I'll I'll do. Uh, I'll do a, a, um, a musical, you know, provide musical background. And, um, and we, we work together quite often. So that's, you know, that, that's one thing that, um, you know, just an example, if you love books, mm. try working with a storyteller, try that. There's always something, there's always something that people don't necessarily think of, you know, so it's a matter of, you know, sitting down and brainstorming and maybe it doesn't even exist yet. Right. You know, yeah. but it could, you know, and it's and sometimes it's up to you. Like, you know, that there is a mansion um, in, in my area in Westchester that they never had a harpist before. But I went to this mansion just for a tour and I went harp belongs right over there by that fireplace and i'm gonna i'm gonna find out who the entertainment person is and i'm gonna give them a card and i'm gonna keep bugging them until and sure enough i i got work there so you know it, sometimes it's a matter of just you know finding out where you fit and mm -hmm. uh, and then fitting <laughs> mm -hmm. wow so, so that's great so what is that workshop called that is called um what did i call that workshop the uh the gigging harpist a walk on the business side now my sense is that many people who are beginning harpists may think that this it will not be applicable to them but i know that someone in my academy had just playing for a few years developed a, a set of shows that she now does you know all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, again, I have it that even if you're a beginning harpist, if you're open to combining the harp with something else, a, a workshop like this could be very valuable for you seeing, oh, wait a minute, maybe I could make money with this. And why not? Why shouldn't you? Right, right, exactly. You know, I mean, when I was a beginner harpist, I didn't gig all the time. I started mm. out small and, you mm. know, I played one Renaissance fair for, you know, for a few weeks. And then that was, that was it. That was it for the year, you know, and that, that I was, that was my, my stepping right. my toe in, um, you know, so I, I think it's, yeah, I think it is, it's, it's good knowledge to have, um, you know, even if you're just, just starting out and, and, and dipping your toe in. Absolutely. So if you're just joining us, this is a marathon session here. Um, and I do see that there are people here. So thank you for listening. I'm here with harpist Erica Lieberman. We are both playing at, we're both giving workshops at the Somerset Harp Festival, which is the biggest teaching harp festival for folk harps in the United States. And we'll be teaching there and giving workshops in July. And so we wanted to interview each other about what we're teaching. So let's see, I have, so now I am two down sure. to two, two, okay, two of them. All right, so, and how many more do you have to share? One or two? I have one more, one okay, more. Okay, so I'll share both of these and then we can get to yours. Okay, so I am teaching dominant chords, unleash the fancy factor. So of course I love harmony and I love how harmony works and I love introductions and I love the dominant chord. So one of the things I love about the dominant chord is that you can do all kinds of things with it. You don't even have to know what it means in order to do something with it. Like if I said, your harp is in the key of C and you play a G and you just play that and then you bliss, bliss, you're doing something fancy with the dominant chord. If you take a shape, you're doing something fancy with the dominant chord and i you know 
I started playing for theater, you know, out outdoor theater when I was a kid. And these little things become, and the king is coming in. And they're marching up to the thing. <laughs> By the way, this also works great for a wedding, this particular thing, as you're waiting for the bride to come in. Is she coming? So that's a th one fancy thing that you can do with the dominant chord. So you can do this at any level. You can also alter, and this is a harmonic thing. So you can have a dominant chord, which is a G chord in the K of C. You can add a seventh to it. You've heard that. But you can also have a flat nine. You can have a sharp five. So you can add all these different harmonies um, to this chord. Um, and, 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 and it's just kind of fun to see that happen. And how does that happen? It can, so it, would this be good for, um, for both beginner harpists and in, I don't know about beginner, 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 um, but certainly fledgling harpists, because it's a wonderful thing to improvise on. It can make improvisation extremely easy, especially right before you play a piece. If you get comfortable with playing stuff on the dominant chord, if you start knowing that you can take any kind of pattern and move it around, then you yeah. know that you, you have plenty of time before your tune begins. And then... <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever you end up playing at that point. Yeah, so yeah. that particular workshop is called Unleash the Fancy Factor of the Dominant Chord. So now what do you love about that? What would that open up for you? Oh, goodness. Well, I think that um, I think it has, you know, it, it has an element of that expansion that that, you right. know, from your other workshop. Right. And, you know, that w which I love. And it also has, it seems to have an element of improvisation. So it's like, it's taking these, mm. these different elements that right. are really useful and kind of um, combining them into this, this, um, this compact package of, of, of this, mm. this chord, you know, and, and where it can go, where it could take you and, um, and how it can um, enhance um, even even the simplest piece. Yeah, and thank you for saying that about expansion. Expansion is really important to me, and the idea of grounding in something simple, being able to expand it or contract it as needed. Like if you get lost, you can always come back to the simple version of it. And we're yeah. actually just about, as we record this, in the Academy, we have four quarters, and this quarter coming up is called Grounded expansion. And it's all about that idea of what can you ground in? What, and what are all the simple ways you can ground? And then how much can you expand? How can you do it easily? How can you do it at your technical level of ability? So yeah, so this class would be great to come to if you want to, um, if you want to tell stories, if you want to um, be able to improvise in a safe way outside of your piece. So for example, this lets you improvise in an introduction. So you mm -hmm. still have the feeling that you're improvising, you still have the fun of it, but you don't have to improvise within the piece itself. So that's what this would be great for. It could it would also, also be used yeah. in an interlude, right? It, Correct. Interlude yes, that's well. right. That's right. You could be playing anything like... <laughs> and you could then go... I can say anything I want and I can make it, I can slow it down and then it allows me to come back to the tune. So you're right, you can use it as an interlude. Yeah. I often encourage people to improvise on, you know, introductions and interludes as one of the first places to safely Improv improvise. So yeah, that would be a great thing. And how should they prepare? They well, prepare. yeah. How would they prepare? Um, I would say come with an open mind, come mm -hmm. knowing that it's not about perfection. It's about connection. It's about trying it out. It's about really having it be okay that you are at the level that you are at, 
It is about discovery and it is about coming and knowing that if I only learn one thing, knowing that I can expand that later on, that, that that's what you should come with. And that's what I would say it would be that kind of attitude. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, all right. And what, and we already talked about what difference. Okay. So my yeah. final class, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll go to yours. My final class mm -hmm. is called sing and play harp. Ooh. Now I love singing and playing. I learned how to play, sing and play on the ukulele as a child. I have a special method It's called three chord magic. There's so many tunes that you can play with three chords and there is a set of shapes that you can play so that you can play a C chord and an F chord and a C chord and a G chord. So you can play any tune. Well, not any tune. Some tunes have other chords, but hundreds <laughs> of tunes. Like, oh, I came from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for the sea. Oh, no, my notice my hand is not moving almost at all. It's, yeah. it's really, it's really, it's really in this one position. So, and the great thing is, once you learn this position, then you can move it to another key very easily. I'm almost moving not at all. And so, and you can also learn accompaniment patterns with it, but it is such a great way to start singing and playing. Yeah. And knowing that you can have open, open up hundreds of tunes that you could play by yourself or with others. So wow. I, I love that. So That's really cool. cool. Thank you. I love it. And um, you can come, you could come to this as a beginner or intermediate or advanced, because once you get that pattern, you can do it. You can just do it like this. Or you could do, I mean, you can, you can make it as big or as small as you want. Again, there's that concept of grounded expansion. So that is my going to be my, I, I don't, I think that's the last course that I'm going to be giving the last workshop. Wow. Okay. I love it. So, I love it. You, okay. What do you love about that? I love that. I, I, I was watching your hand very carefully and mm -hmm. you were hardly moving it at all. So I love the simplicity of that mm -hmm. because my biggest challenge personally, when I'm trying mm -hmm. to sing with the harp mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is, you know, just, the complexity, I'm trying to think of what I'm doing with my voice. I'm trying to think of what I'm doing with my fingers and it, I get overwhelmed and I, I, I stiffen up, oh. my throat stiffens up and I can't, you know, I, I'm having trouble singing because I'm, I'm just so tense uh -huh. and by just having that simplicity, that, that chord, if you don't have to think about it, right. Then you can, you have that freedom and the voice just takes care of itself. But if you're like rigid and trying to, oh, what, what am I doing while I'm singing? I'm playing right. this, I'm doing this, and I, I don't know, I don't know what to do, ah, you know? <laughs> yes, I know that feeling. <laughs> you know, it's funny because so, I, can re I can remember as a little girl of seven learning the three chords and just the magic of learning three chords on the ukulele and how I felt like it opened up an entire world to me. And it felt there was nothing I could not sing without those three chords. And, um, and what you just said, Erica, which is once you get that pattern, you don't have to think. You're not trying to calculate stuff at the same time as trying to be expressive. Right. That's, that's a great tool. That is yeah. really, really great. I can, yeah. Thank you. I Thank you. Go, I want to go to all your workshops, Deborah. I, <laughs> I hope you do. I hope you do. I want to come to yours. I want to come. I want to come to this gigging one. I'm excited <laughs> about that. All right. So, Erica, what is your final workshop? And for anyone oh. joining us, Erica Lieberman and I are both harp players. We will both be giving workshops at the Somerset Harp Festival. I'm gonna pull that up one last time, or maybe it won't be the last time. And 
so that you can see Somerset Harp Festival, largest folk harp festival in the US and it's a teaching festival. You come to learn. There are also concerts as well, but you're always taking part. There's a huge amount of participation there, which is what I love. All right, and your final workshop, Erica. My final workshop is a workshop on, I can't remember what, what it ended up being called, but this is, uh, this is playing the harp at Dickens festivals. Oh, so, which is also something I do when I'm not at Ren Fairs and it's and it's the holiday season. I play a lot of Dickens events. Now, um, they are a, uh, a, a of growing popularity in in the U.S. Uh, they're they're popping up everywhere, and and not all um, Dickens events are called Dickens festivals. So sometimes they can be a little tricky to find. So I'm going to talk about ways you know to find the ones that are local to you. A lot of times, something that is presented as a Christmas event or a holiday event. Oh. Actually, you go there and everyone's dressed in Victorian, you know, Dickensian garb. Oh. And there's there's a telling of, of, of uh, a, a Christmas carol. And, you know, it, so it's really the same thing, essentially. Um, so half the workshop is going to be talking about, um, you know, just like my workshop on Ren Fairs, what it's like working at these Dickens festivals. We're going to talk about costuming. We're going to talk about the culture. We're going to talk about getting the work. And then the second half of it, we're, we're going to learn um, a couple of simple um, Victorian Christmas carols. That's great. These are so practical. I love how all of these are so practical. And I love how you will be able to use my fancy dominant chord. Yes. <laughs> as the introductions and you will that's be able right. if you sing these songs you will be able to use this that, oh that's great Indeed. Indeed. wow and you know and another another element that we'll be talking about um in, in this workshop is um how to accompany a christmas carol because often for a harpist that's part of working mm -hmm. at these events and there's a lot of really fun ways you can take Christmas carols and make them a part of that story. And, um, and I do that uh, every year with Jonathan Kruk um, when wow, we perform Christmas so carols great. together. So I'll be taking, you know, pieces from, you know, the, the way that I work with him and, and giving examples and yeah. So it'll be a fun workshop. I think people will enjoy it. Wow. That's so, uh, that's great. I am I'm, I'm just kind of blown away. I'm so glad I, I asked to, to do this interview because it's Me just, so, yeah, it's so <laughs> fascinating to hear that these workshops that you're giving and that I'm giving, they're so different in some ways and they're so relevant. Like th th this whole gig thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they do. And um, the the really practical side of like, okay, now you have this skill or even a little bit of it, or you have this passion, what can you do with it to mm -hmm. actually be in the world sharing, maybe making money, which would also be great, whether, but, but you're out there and you're actually doing it and sharing it with people. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so is there anything also see? Oh, let's see. Oh, do we, have any, we do. Do we have a question? Let's see here. Oh. Um, I don't think so. I think it looks like we have a question anytime I pull that um, Somerset Harp Festival thing up on the screen. But we have people who are watching. So oh, still good. watching after an hour and 14 minutes. Oh so, my goodness. I know. <laughs> Thank so you. Many, I know. And this, is, and this has been so fun. Anybody have any questions? And i um, just trying to think if there's any other questions that I would want to ask you um, about coming to Somerset. I mean, for people who haven't been to the Somerset Harp Festival, it usually takes place in a in a hotel, so it's very comfortable. You get a room, and um, you there's it is it, really amazing. You're see, seeing people roll their harps all over the place. So you've got your harp, you've got your harp companions in many cases, and yes. there are concerts every night, many, many, many workshops all day. Yeah. 
and, and and after hours events too you know there's there's uh, i think that this year there's going to be um some dancing there's usually right. an irish session right there's um a lot of events and one of the things i there are two things i really love um that you know one is i mentioned before i i want to take all of your workshops but in the case that you know we, we have overlapping mm -hmm. ones Mm -hmm. they're also going to be online after the festival, right. That's which, right. is, which is so great because then, then, you know, it's not quite the same as getting to be part of your class in person, but at least right. I won't completely miss out. I'll be able right. to see it. Yeah. So, and I always love that the, the fact that you can watch them afterwards, you can speed up and slow down so yeah. you can go back and you can check on things over and over again. The other yeah, thing that's great about do. this festival is that many of the teachers have handouts and you have teachers you have teachers from all around the world yes and there are often some big surprises and the other thing that's great about this festival is there is a an exhibit hall so mm -hmm. anyone who's thinking about playing the harp and you want to just go there and check out all the harps from mm -hmm. many of the harp builders in the US and then there's harp jewelry and then there's harp you know harp tchotchkes and there's harp Jeez. jewelry oh. a harp and harp <laughs> And harps. harps. And you can okay. sit down and play right. all these harps yeah. that, you know, you might live in an area where you don't have a harp center nearby. Right. You don't have an opportunity to play and try out different harps and hear the different voices of different instruments. And you can just, I, I, I've spent, you know, hours just in the yeah. exhibit hall. I'm right. I mean, it's so amazing if you're thinking of buying an instrument or a piece of equipment to mm -hmm. actually get to sit down and try it out. Because mm -hmm. usually my experience is it's called form factor. Something fits your body in a certain way where it's really sort of made for you or you're made for it. And you'll, you won't know that until you actually play it. But there's, I've always experienced that when I play, have a harp, like, oh, that's my instrument. I feel it from the very first moment. And then, and, and you get to meet, you get to literally meet some of the builders, some of the harp builders. Yeah. yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, and you get to talk to them, and they'll tell you about how the harps work and how they built them, and show you pictures. I mean, it's yeah. it's such an incredible opportunity to explore the harp community, yes. which means, and the international harp community means players, teachers, mm -hmm. builders, composers, people who are companions of those people, mm -hmm. and and you start to realize this is an incredible community of people, all of whom together create this world in which this instrument ends up, you know, becoming a therapy instrument and a concert instrument and an instrument of, I mean, it just, it's, right. it's amazing to see the whole world. So I, I will invite, you know, I invite people to just come even just for a day or to come to one of the concerts and then to see if you can get into the exhibit hall to see what's there. I agree, Deborah. I think that, you know, my absolute, I love everything about the Somerset Harp Festival, but I think my absolute favorite thing about it is the community, is just the folk harp community and being with your people. Just be, just soaking in that, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like you walk in and you're just like, ah, these are my peeps. Yeah, we all have this common thing that just brings us together, this unity. And, you know, we all come from different walks of life mm -hmm. and whatever, but when we're there, we're all harpists and that's it. And, and we just, we can talk shop and nobody's going to get bored. Yeah. We can, you know... <laughs> We can just, you know, we we could just uh, play music together. We could. It's just great. It's great being being around uh, these people. It just uh, right. I think no community, no other community quite like it. Are you in other communities? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yes, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I do think that part of what is so beautiful, it is, it does have that community aspect that is in every community of like where of that, of the sense of belonging. And I, I'm sorry, that was like mean of me, but I was just thinking, <laughs> it, it, 
it's that, up in the communities. It's, that, it's that sense of belonging, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've played, no matter mm -hmm. how well you play, no matter how many fingers you have, no matter how big or little your harp is. It's right. the it's that sense of belonging and getting to look at others and getting to talk to them and having yeah. this opportunity to have all these classes where you belong, you can come in there, you can do it at your level, you take away what you want to take away. Yes. So I, I hope that, you know, anyone who plays the harp, who's thinking about playing the harp, you will join us at the Somerset Harp Festival. And if you've come to the end of this already, um, and, and also check out each of our, our websites. And I put it into the um, into the, the the caption for this. And we're doing things at different times. Like I'm doing workshops, a walk, workshop right now, when I, we're recording this, this is in March. I'm just about to do a workshop, a five-day harp challenge that's free that people can come to. And Erica, I'm sure you're doing stuff all around the year. So if you go to our websites, you can see the things that we're doing at any time. You can see the events, you can connect with us. So I hope you will do that. And I hope that we will see you at the Somerset Harp Festival. And Erica, thank you so much for thank meeting you. me and in the thank interview. You, thank Laura. you. This has been and so, so much fun. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And so everyone go forth and harp on the good things in life.